Hello, everyone, and welcome to Political Paradigm, where politicians, policymakers, and influencers get to speak in detail about politics and issues revolving around them. I am Terry Ikumi. My guest today is a female politician from Kogi State, a former SDP governorship candidate, and is now the Kogi Central Senatorial Candidate under the platform of the People's Democratic Party, Natasha Akwati Udwagan. Welcome to Political Paradigm. Thank you. Good afternoon, Terry, and good afternoon, Nigerians. Let me begin this conversation fully okay. now by congratulating you on uh, sure. winning at the appeal court. How do you react to that judgment? Um, it didn't come as a surprise to me because um, the primaries went according to the guidelines and regulations as stipulated by the Electoral Act and the Nigerian Constitution. But well, in politics, you're bound to have an aggrieved party. And then, yeah, so we won at the high court and we won again at the appeal court. But again, um, in the open, extending a hand of uh, friendship to Alajia Demuata and every other aggrieved member that look, let's come together and win for our party, for our people, for our state and country. Very well. Let's take a look at your political history now. You have run for Senate, for governor, and now you're back to running for Senate again. And many yeah. would want to know why you have chosen to go for Senate this time. Because I just um, believe that that platform is going to afford me and accord me the best chance to represent my people, to make positive change and reforms and pass very smart, effective bills that will improve the social economic stance of not just Kogi Central, Kogi State, but Nigeria at large. And um, as you would know, I have for long been the face of the uh, advocacy for the revival of Ajakuta still come. That's how it started. I did everything possible, myself and my lean team, and of course, with support from Nigerians are far and wide to ensure that that project is brought to the bonus, which also led to the bilateral agreement again in 2019 at the Russian African Economic Forum in uh, Moscow. And all of that is almost like at every point you think you're just going to get things right someone from somewhere uses his pen to override that and has made me understand that even though in democracy and in shaping a country, the, the true government is the people, but then the man holding the pen um, that can actually decide in the sport and that becomes so permanent is acts important, is even more important. So that's why I said, okay, if that's what it takes, then I will try to be there so that I don't just speak as an advocate or as a mere indigent of Kogi Central or Nigeria wanting to speak for the industrialization and all the benefits the steel sector can bring. I also want to have an authority. And that's the authority that, say, that, that has the, this, this desire to get that authority has lured me into politics. I'm not a career politician. And, uh, but that being said, I do respect all politicians who have contributed their quota in shaping our democratic space the way it is today. But I believe that there's a huge chance to reform and get things better. And just how have you prepared for this next shot at the Senate? And what sort of confidence does that give you going into the elections? I... Should I say um, a born leader? Right from my days in primary school, I used to be the social prefect. Then when I got into Federal Government College, Duane, I was the senior prefect girl, the, what's called the head girl. Then I um, went to University of Abuja, then law school, the University of Dundee. I graduated with the best result in the, my MBA oil and gas master in class. I'm more concerned and, about how you've prepared politically. Well, I'm just telling you this, politically now, because I am who I am, I've been able to transcend that into my campaigns. Now, by and large, before I got into SDP then, I was already a popular household name because of my advocacy. And like I said, I just find that, um, like I said, it's by nature. I didn't have to learn that. But whenever I meet with people, I tried to interact. During my last uh, campaign sessions, I went from word to word. I sold the manifesto to them. I incorporated the thoughts and desires and aspirations and needs of each community, each trade sect, the Gary sellers, the farmers, the welders, the Okada unions. I met with all of them, even the student bodies, and I was able to get 
a blend of their intentions. And that actually shaped me. No one ever knows it all, you know, and I left myself to be vulnerable in accepting what their needs, and that actually groomed me. Talking about preparedness, I'm very prepared. I'm going to go in by God's grace. I appreciate the risk involved. For some reason, almost every allegation has come to life in the past few weeks. Whenever I get to know that, oh, Natasha, be careful, there's going to be a shutdown of your campaign office. Once I get that, two days later, I get to see a letter from them. Do you understand? Like now we're in court. We just find a process in the file the process in a court in Kogi State to allow us used continue usage of that office. So it's like I think we will talk about um, this thing, whatever it is between you and the Habelu in yes. between. But let me let's finish with your political history now. Um, you say that you're not a career politician. Uh, it's almost like you're building up to that. You know, you when the first shot at the Senate didn't come through, you opted for the governorship race. Yes. Now you're back to running for the Senate. And yes. uh, the Kogi governorship election is in November, I believe. No, yeah, December, November, but this, the primaries will yeah. be between March and April next year. Absolutely. So November. what happens if you don't win um, the Senate election? Will you consider returning to run for governor? No, I, first, I'm extremely positive that we're going to win. And um, no, I don't intend to go for governorship. Why? Even in 2019, I actually wanted to, to my, my, if you compare me being in the Senate or the governorship at that time, I would have preferred the Senate at all time, because more than the governorship at that time. So I just went into the governorship race to see if, okay, if I could just use test that platform. The Not just test the waters. If I could also find, use that avenue, that platform to effect the change in an executive manner. But I think for this moment, my voice will be more useful right. in the legislature. Let, let's look um, at the processes that led to your participation in elections so far. How would you assess the elections you've participated in from the primaries to main election? Now or previously, if you're comparing previously, all along. Absolutely. I just want to. Um, in SDP, I was pretty much the only aspirant, so that was fairly easy. But talking about uh, this, we were seven of us. I uh, was the only female. And um, again, I won, even though we had a lot of aggrieved members. And then over time, we spoke to quite a few of them, and they have already on board. So I could say it was a tougher um, game in PDP, but again, like I said, that's what strengthens uh, the system because it made anyone feel, okay, if you want to come in, you have to be the very best. You have to put your best foot forward. Then, um, talking about the election day itself, when I was in SDP in 2019, I had a lot of followers. The masses were my strongest rock, and even right now. But what we lacked there were the strong agents, the party agents. We didn't have quite a lot. So it was like the votes came in, and we didn't have gatekeepers to protect the votes. But now what I see in PDP, being a more formidable party, um, solid structures across all polling units itself, I find that but now, when this same amount of votes and even more come, we'll have stronger gatekeepers that yeah, will the not allow... Is the PDP really strong in Kogi State? Because it like is. Because like Elia said... It's very you, strong you now. You defeated the PDP in 2019. Yes. On that, while you were in the SDP. Yes. So, despite the national structure which the PDP has, does it really have a structure in Kogi State? Yeah, or have a, you brought in a stronger structure? I've brought in... I've been able to bring in the vigor that strength that broadens the participation of people in the structure remains the same and this is where we talk about the candidates and the party so it both must work together in sdp we had a stronger candidate which was me and a weaker platform in sdp but today we're having a strong candidate and a strong platform Am I making myself clear, Mr. Well, Tim? I think the polls will determine that. Yes, and <laughs> well, I look forward to that. And of course, again, with the reforms we see now, the beavers and all that, I believe it's going to be very difficult for the games that were played in rigging me out in 2019. It will be very difficult because what happened then, yes, the PDP gentleman, uh, who is a dear friend of mine right now, and... Um, Whatever um, activities I'm um, doing politically, I'm actually writing on the platform he has 
played. Now, even though I defeated him then, he got 18,000 plus votes. I had 48,000, over 30,000 gap. But then suddenly we saw the APC bring up a list of 75,000. And days after the election, I got some officials. Well, you know how it is, like some people who are in a, even from PDP then and other parties, they will send pictures of ballot papers, SDP ballot papers that were torn and taken out of the boxes. And they're just in heaps. Oh, Natasha, see what we found at the backyard. And these were votes. So what happened then was there were lots of thumb-printed APC ballot papers that were stuffed in while mine destroyed. Do you understand? And that was how they were able to come up with uh, 75,000. But I don't think that's going to happen now because the accreditation process is dig digital, be transmitted live, as we said, and it will be more difficult for them to come up with um, stolen PVCs or thumb printed, and there was going to be a lot of mismatch. So I truly believe that uh, INEC has done a good job. And even though I'm aware that there are some people who are trained to maneuver this beaver system, but um, I believe that is why we are educating our polling unit agent to know, and, uh, to know what the processes are and identify when certain wrongs are being committed. You know, I think it's interesting that you commend INEC for the beavers and the electronic transmission of results because I recall that you were uh, one advocate, but you were advocating for e-voting. And at some point, you said that we cannot have a credible process until we get to this e-voting stage. Are you now confident that uh, even though we don't have e-voting, that e-transmission and BVAS system would help the process? You know, um, I know that processes take time. Like they say, Rome isn't built in a day. Do I have 100% comfort in the process so far, the BVAS? I don't have 100%. That's why I told you that. It's, I'm also aware that there are some people who have devised the means to maneuver around the beavers and still, you know, put forth. And that is why we are um, training our P agents and also trying to be more vigilant on that day and to avert such processes. But so far, it's a progress. It's, I believe it's better off than the last. Look at what happened in AKT and was it uh, Ogun? Ocean, Ocean State. State, exactly. I had good feedback from the field where they said, look, they tried everything possible, but they couldn't. And then, you know, so that gives some comfort. No, it's not absolute, but we still appreciate this progress so far. All Hopefully right. in the next few years, we'll then get to e-voting and even get diasporas to vote. I mean, it's all about process of innovation because that's talking about diasporas. I was in California and um, months back. And there's a huge body of Nigerians there, just like every other part of the world. I mean, talking about UK. And these people actually contribute to Nigeria's economy by sending money, you know, the remitting monies in uh, billions of dollars annually. To, and that's one is set of the... So they have a way of supporting us, and, but denying them the right to vote is an injustice. And I hope that when I get into the Senate, that's one of the bills we're going to pass to ensure that the diasporans actually have a voting right wherever they are. Uh, let's talk about uh, women participation in politics now. Let me begin with Kogi State. Uh, it would seem that the participation of women in politics in Kogi State is quite low. Is Nigeria at large. Nigeria at large. That's why I chose to start with Kogi State. And um, there are concerns as to whether the political terrain in Kogi State does not allow, or should we attribute that to just Nigeria at large, as you say? Because I recall that the governor had made a move to get women involved in the process, one of which was ensuring that the, vi the deputy chairman of the local government were women. Is that commendable? He just did that to, to just uh, try to get some positive scores for his presidential ambition. He didn't mean that. that but was beyond the politics, move. there are local government, deputy local government chairmen that are women now. Why, what stops a local government chairman from being a woman? Today, there is no, of the, of the 21 local governments, we have no female. And, um, and the, the, the House of Assembly of Kogi State is an all-male thing. So he has been very unfair to women. We don't have House of Reps members. We don't have Senate. Is it his making? Have women come forth to run for these offices and how has he shelved them out? I wouldn't want to speak to his person as to whether he negates women 
Do you understand? Like, but what I know is he has not been quite fair. The, pro the policies he has put forth have not been quite fair. But let's speak about... No, but what sort women. of policies? Let's speak about the women themselves. How do, how do I put... Well, well, should I say... It's just the way he's... One, he surrounds himself with, all men, with only men. He doesn't give a chance for women. If you look at his cabinet, most of the people that go around with him to commission projects are all men. It's, I would say again, let me take this back, probably cultural inclination, should I say, or religious. Now let's start. Um, in Nigeria today, unlike just Kogi State, uh, most people find it difficult to trust a woman occupying a position of authority because they feel by nature or what they grew observing in their societies, their mothers always really get, were really related to their back. And that has actually shaped the minds of people, should I say if possibly even the governor himself, who assumed that a woman at best should be a wife, a housewife, or just take the back seat in support. There are, that's why I say that probably there are some ideals or exposures that he has had, environmental impact into his um, making that have made that does not see a need to balance the gender when it comes to his team or his cabinet or all of that. So um, the cultural effect is real. The um, societal expectation is real. Then we talk about the financial implications of contesting as a woman is real. I mean, we live in a man's world. Uh, as it said, even though I see quite a number of feminists trying to push for a decent space for women to be recognized, I see that happening. But also, there's the other part of the marital allowance, should I say, whether the spouse will be able to accommodate the late night meetings, the insults and attacks that come with the dirty game of politics. Um, not everyone would allow that. So there are a lot of inhibitions that actually stop and deny, or should I say, you know, that, that don't allow a woman or they kind of limit a woman's participation. I should probably ask you this question yeah. now that you've mentioned this. Um, you, had met, you had told my colleague that you were tagged on fit to run in 2019 because you were single. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, that was the present commissioner for information, Kingsley Farmer. He just spoke said it on air that I was unfit because I was a Christian and my district is Muslim dominated therefore and also because I was single I had an improper family these are the words he used she has an improper family and therefore she cannot lead and again these are the things that we say that women face um, there are the attacks on any woman who puts herself forward to aspire to contest an elective position she gets cut bit by bit she gets castigated from her making from who she is to whether she's single or not that's the side even if she's married who is she married to like the moment i go i got married my husband is from delta state then there were these attacks that okay i got married to a delta man i should go contest in delta state so a lot of all these attacks come and they not every woman has the courage to go through these tides. It's quite tough, but then um, I would say this, that is why it's very important for us to have an affirmative action, an affirmative policy. If you look at President Macron, the moment he got into office, he made a policy that half of his cabinet would be women. You know, look at Rwanda, 68% of them, they are consciously putting in women in there, you know, as again setting them on the same pedestal to compete with the men. When you know most often are not the men will win. They have more money. They are able to have meet all night ignoring the home uh, responsibilities. They're able to, there's less attack on the personality. With due respect to my brother, Senator Dino Melai, he contested for the Senate seat as well. And no one actually attacked him on being single. Do you understand? But here, once Natasha comes up, it's always, she's single. Oh, she's, not, she's married. Who did she get married to? This and that. And that has to stop. You seem to be very disturbed by the tag of uh, singlehood and politics and how it affects politics. And now you're married. Does that change anything? Does that change your perception in any way? I didn't get married because I wanted to fit in. Let's get that clear. I got married because I loved my husband. <laughs> but then, 
um, if I were still single, I would have still contested. But let me tell you this. The people, the populace, they didn't see anything wrong with me. I got the 48,000 votes as a single person. Do you understand? So, but, but among the political class, yes. is it a concern? Is the singlehood or the wise of a woman a concern among the political class based on the fact that you've interacted with the political class? I've seen with the political class it's an issue. Yes. But with the electorate, the, the, the masses, it's not an issue. But what are the details of this issue? I, I, let me say this. I remember I was called several times, even before the main election, once I got my ticket, I was a candidate for the SDP. I was called by people I didn't even expect to utter such. Oh, Natasha, you know you need to get married because Kogi Central is part of the northern states and they would do, it's not nice enough for you to be single you don't set a good example for our young women i mean i wouldn't i like you but i wouldn't want to give my vote to you because you would kind of embolden our wives at home that we can achieve if natasha can do it as a single woman we too can you know all of this so i saw that and uh, with due respect to their opinions i probably feel um they were to an extent culturally, based on their, those who feel that way are culturally right. I can't, um, Nigeria is a very diverse country and what goes, what is acceptable in the South is not probably acceptable in the North. So I can't impose my, my beliefs, my desires on people. So whatever, all these opinions that came, I took cognizance of that. And, uh, but, and by chance that has happened, I got married before this. But I didn't get married just to fit in to the desires of people. If God had not brought forth a spouse that would be able to understand my political life and the risk that comes with Natasha as a person and my love for the people and the fact that I'm such a philanthropist, I love to do the projects out of pocket. If I had not found such a person, then I would have remained single and I would have still contested. You see, most women in the National Assembly today are either wives of big wigs or daughters of from households with pedigree as they call not like me that you know from a humble background my dad died 23 years ago you know i've just by the grace of god become a woman of substance that i am today so it's not easy to find a woman on her own stride just making it against the odds you know as against having a, a son name a father's son name that will you know sign the dots for me you know but, you know, you know that, that that raises my curiosity as yeah. to how uh, also how what sort of political mentorship that you received uh, before venturing into politics? Political mentorship? None. None? Well, political mentorship, you see. Yes. But I have had quite a lot of people that I I've don't want to say godfathers. To. No, I, okay, I have no godfather. I have no political godfather. I'd never had in the last election, and I don't have now. And I have reasons for that, because I've come to see that most people who are sponsored by a godfather owe them their voice. And that is one reason why you see people who, con who campaign passionately and you expect so much of them. But when they get to the House of Assembly, the National Assembly, they get weak and they don't, all the promises they make, they don't put them because they sit there day in, day out doing the bids of their godfathers. And sometimes, to make things worse, these godfathers are not even from the state. So imagine someone serving as a senator in Kogi State while his godfather is from Lagos or Ogun State or somewhere are else. Are you saying that there is no politician, there is no established politician backing you now? None. Not even within the PDP that you belong to? Political, like godfather? I like wouldn't say godfather, godfather you mean? Him, but I know that, for example, there are some governors who bought forms for certain candidates. Nobody. There are some others who are putting them through certain, you know, processes to help them win the election. None? Nobody. What I have is goodwill from people. Like, I got some, a gentleman brought two bags of T-shirts, printed campaign. I get my campaign materials donated for me. Another gentleman um, donated 20 phones. 
you know, like handsets to assist with the, you know, calling people, the electorates and encouraging them, sending manifestos over the phone. But to, I have not collected a COBA from anyone in donation, even as 100 naira from anyone now, no. In 2018 election, I ran an account for crowdfunding and I was able to get about 11 million naira. The first 1 million I got was from a lady from Kano State, not even from my place. The first, no, the first money I got was 500,000 naira, an Igbo man from Abdiya State. I have not met him today. I don't even have his number. It was just a check that came in. I tell you, God bless you, sir. Then the second was a lady, one millionaire, and then I got people. Then the third was a professor from Futmina. Goodness, I've forgotten his name. The professor, he gave me 500,000. He called me that that's all his savings he put forth because he knows that when I get in there, I'll be able to get a Jakuta working and create jobs for our people. So that is it. And I, I may, it's not like I have not had people tell me, oh, Natasha, try to meet Tiwa Danjuma, try to meet Tinubu, try to meet Atiku. I have not met her president one, but I've spoken over the phone, presidential candidate, you know, and we've shared ideas on the reforms we expect. So, but I have not, and I don't intend to. And even if tomorrow someone comes and says, Natasha, take this 100 million, 500 million to support your elections, I would not want to take it. Would you respect that person? Because I understand, I don't want my voice to be old. I don't want to see a wrong in the constitution or a wrong treaty, a wrong policy, or, and then begin to think, oh, my, I, this person owed me a favor. But I have quite a lot of people who have shaped me, people like Professor Pato Tomi, who I met during the advocacy for Jakarta Steel Company, even the present PDP chairman, uh, Dr. Yocha Ayu, he was my father's friend. Um, they were in the National Assembly at the same time during, um, was it the Fifth National Assembly? Yeah, or so. And he's been of great support to me, you know, over the while calling again, where are you with this project? Why didn't you And that's not how you this? got the ticket? No, 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 no. He, no, that's not. <laughs> he was in PDP then. I was in SDP. I remember I moved into SDP. I was it talking was... <laughs> about now. <laughs> now, no. I mean, but if I you do come on national quite... TV. Oh, let me say this. Just a second. You know, if you come on national TV to say that the present PDP chairman. national chairman is, used to be <laughs> your I'm... father's friend. Yes, but let me say this. I'm telling you, even about to my father's friend. I was probably like eight years old then, but when we started talking on the Ajakuta, he was one of those who, when I discover some things, I'll go rob mines. What do we do, sir? I unveil this really conspiracy. Share a relationship. But I also, at the same time, met with the uh, APC presidential candidate, Bala Ahmed Tinubu, around the same time, just letting you know that behind the scene. Because many asked me then, do I have. Now, I didn't collect a Kobo from them. Uncle Yacha never gave me a Kobo. Um, the APC presidential candidate, too, never gave me a couple. But what I did was, as a statesman, I approached him, sir, this is what I uncovered. How do we go about this? He put on his own thoughts here and there. So there are many Nigerians then. I wasn't in politics at that time, but I respected them as people who had a voice to say or who could feed me a bit on what happened at that time in the 70s, in the 80s. I was hunting for information. I was digging deep. So I went around to all this, but never did I collect a Koban. So, 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 so was the PDP national chairman, E.H. Ayu, instrumental to you joining the PDP? Because you had the option of the APC. And I say so because you were looking for a party with a structure. Yes. Now, you were asking whether... He was the, instrumental he to was you instrumental. joining the PDP. Uh, no, he wasn't. Because um, there was no way I would have gone into APC. Yahya Bello, the manner in which he chooses his candidates and ignores the interests and intentions of others. There was just no way. But what endeared me to PDP was the structure from national down. It's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't join in because I know a person. I would first assess the possibilities, assess the reforms the party has made over the past few years, and now think if it will feed, and accord, feed into my plans, see if it will accord me a chance to plug in my political career, and that's what I saw. There was a great reform, I mean, from the past, um, a PDP structure, and then that's it. So, no, he didn't call me and say, oh, come join in, I'm going to train. No, no, neither did he coerce me into it, no. 
I'm a woman of my own thoughts. But I like to think that you went to him to <laughs> at least let him know your intention. If you didn't join the party because of him, when knowing that he is the chairman, you probably consulted with him uh, on your ambition. Like everyone did. Almost everyone uh, consulted, not just him, like there were other members of the, of the party. You, you, know? Know, you know, some persons say that uh, people like you should have uh, left the old order and joined, say, the Labour Party, the obedience movement, and uh, perhaps because of its affinity with young people. And Labour Party is also an old order. That, I it's mean, just because they didn't get, uh, they've not uh, um, been privileged in securing a presidential seat. Labour Party, Labour Party is not new. I'm talking about the candidacy of Peter Obi and what it's brought to the Labour Party. Which many see as not the same as uh, regular politicians, as you've What has it brought said, in, if I may ask? Hasn't brought anything to the Labour Party? What I see is the people themselves that have brought, projected... The sort of youth. largely young people, I believe. Exactly. It's not Peter Obi himself that brought in the vigour. As at March, when you were leaving, or when you were joining the PDP, the Labour Party was not this big. When you look back now, do you wish you had joined the Labour Party? No, I don't have any regrets with joining the PDP. Like I said, because before I joined the PDP, I looked at the structure of the party. I also went through the PDP's manifesto, a bit of which I put in, my, in page 19 of mine. And uh, it resonates with me at the moment. And... Um, but I also respect and appreciate the drive and vigor that uh, His Excellency Peter Obi has brought to the more critic space today. But I would say this, that the greater part of the move that we see or the movement that we see is resonates from the young people who just have a strong desire for something new, something fresh. You know, it's, and I, I like this political awareness from them. And, uh, but again, it has to be guided and guarded. And the people, in conjunction with the candidates, have a whole lot to do in ensuring victory. And whether this processes in form of synergy and structure is being met at the Labour Party level, I don't know. But um, um, for me... In PDP, with Atiku Abubakar and uh, His Excellency Okowa as the presidential candidate and the vice presidential candidate, I see a whole lot of experience and form and structure being put in there. And also, um, uh, quite a lot of young people, too, um, you know, led or endeared themselves into the PDP today because they have come to entrust what uh, our presidential candidate has stood for over the years. If you ask an average person today on the street, well, not like on the street, in some corporate fields, they will be able to tell you, oh, they either work in Atiko Baka's private organization, any of his companies, either the construction or the ports or here or importation or whatever it is, and that he has impacted in lives. He has helped create jobs. But I'm sorry, with due respect to the obedience. When I ask these same questions, I find it very difficult to have one person who will say, you know what, I was able to get this because of the opportunities His Excellency Peter Obi was able to create. Are you getting my point? It's just in also, with due respect to uh, the APC presidential candidate, people call him more of a people's builder. He picks people from wherever and then empowers the people and creates an opportunity for them to succeed and to serve our country, respective of the of the state, their state of origin. That's what the good that's attributed to uh, the APC presidential candidate. So what I'm saying by and large is all three candidates are strong are contenders. All three have their own areas of um, strength. And, uh, but I know that for today, the, a the PDP today has a, has a stronger chance, not just because... Um, the demographics of the North favor, no. Because I know that in discussions, I've had people say, oh, it's just the North that's going to vote and buck not so. We have a strong support from the South as well, Delta State, 
um, Bielsa, Akwaibom, even Edo states who have quite a large support from there. And Kogi as well, that is now going to shift itself from the APC to the PDP. And like I said, if you look at the manifesto of all the three candidates again. You know, I think it's interesting yeah. that. Hold on, if you see just this. a second. I think it's interesting that you would mention all these states and leave out the states of the G5 governors who are dissatisfied with what's happening in the PDP. Is that intentional? Oh, no. Um, even Benway itself. Let's talk about Benway. My national chairman is from, is from Benway. Oh, uh, Dr. Yocha is from Benue. And you think and that Atiku average... would win in Benue despite the fact that the will. governor doesn't he support will. The go him? Governor Autumn does not represent the minds of the people of Benue State, no. But even with due respect to his grievances, I believe that he's all, every, he and many others are going to come to term. They're all going to work for the party. They're all going to work for the party. I believe it's all going to be settled in the shortest of time. But definitely, Benue is going to go PDP. River State? Definitely. Ah, oh, His Excellency Wiki. I know that he's more of an open book when it comes to his feelings. He says things and, as they are. I like people like that. But also, I know and I pray that in the few weeks to come, there will be a meeting of the mind and there will be some resolution so that we can have one harmonious uh, presidential campaign. It's just about four months before the but elections. Even though, even though we're running out of time, he's still campaigning for PDP in the state. Who's campaigning? Um, His Excellency Wiki. He is? Yes, Not he the is. presidential candidate. I hope you know that. Well, you know the elections are going to be on the same day. The presidential candidate, the senatorial Is that the trick the you hope would happen? It's, uh, listen. <laughs> I mean, the man's openly said... That seems... Why are you asking me such tough I mean, questions? you brought this up. You brought this up. I mean, the man's openly said that since the PDP presidential candidate has chosen to ignore him, that he, I mean... No, I, no you know, him. let me say this. Um, I am privy to some of this information behind the scene. And I can tell you that no one ignored anybody. It's all a matter. It's just a matter of one party reaching out to the other. And the other one is too angered and pained to accept the call for peace and truce at that time or the other or one party reaching out for truce while the other giving conditions that's what it is let's 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 finish up with you and your senatorial ambition now let's talk about your manifesto uh you've given me a copy of that manifesto and yes. i see that it's sort of an extension of your 2019 manifesto in 2019 you talked about fixing the future yes now you talked about now you're talking about a reborn hope of 2023. Yes, yeah, so my manifesto now is on economic development and social justice. Economic development, which of course has um, the Ajakuta Steel Company on the front burner. And uh, I have observed quite a lot of wrong information being circulated in the news. Um, today you hear that Ajakuta Steel Company is working. The next day you hear that it's not the third day you see that is a settlement of $496 million to Global Steel Holding, a company which has no hold, has no bearing, and we do not owe a cobble to. The next thing you see that $250 million have been paid out of the $496 million. And I'm asking the question, where did we at this point get $250 million to settle who? Is there a court judgment that, the, that hold, binds us in debt to this company? There is none. The social contract is more about projecting the interests of the people, host community rights, the advantages that should be of benefit to them, ensuring that each life matters, ensuring that educational systems, health care, the road networks, portable water, all of these social amenities are met. Electricity for all. Internet as part of the innovations I'm going to put forth in all public schools. If Rwanda can do it, it doesn't cost much. So this and many more I'm going to bring forth in a more interesting ways. I'm going to, I've also understood that pretty much the National Assembly District is allowed 500 million naira worth of projects per budget. But I believe that I will be able to get projects worth billions that I will be able to operate even X the budget itself because I know there are lots of international organizations that have, that have trust funds and money set up to develop Africa. 
I'm going to try to harness that for women, for healthcare, for children, and for many others. That means once we get in, there'll be activities springing up from different parts, not just to Kogi Central alone, but if I'm in any committee, so that means I'll be able to get projects through that committee for Nigerians across the country. As we round up this conversation, one thing is quite clear. There's a rift between you and the Kogi state governor, Yaya Bello. Now, Nigerians have observed that that battle has continued, and it is not clear as to when it began or what exactly is the reason for the rift between you and Yaya Bello. Is this personal or is it politics? I think it's personal because I, this is not politics anymore. If you look at what defines politics, and as the Nigerian constitution provides a free, fair, enabling environment, even he as a governor that is responsible to protecting my life, my properties, he's gone beyond that and has taken it personal. And uh, I think that now goes to his being, whereby he doesn't want to be challenged. Do you understand? Because it's like, almost like, um, I think I'll call it a delusion of grandeur, when you assume so much impotence and relevance to yourself beyond who you are, you then try to play God in everything. He doesn't want, he wants his statements to be permanent. When he, speaking from experience, you know, I was actually even in APC for two months before I moved into SDP. So while I was there and I expressed my intentions, he called all aspirants, including myself, and he tried to offer me. He said, how much would it take you to he said, Natasha, you're not my chosen candidate, aspirant, should I say then. So how much would it take you to step down? I said, I'm not here for the money. He said, how much? 50 million, 70 million. That's most candidates took 20 million. I was like, well, I'm not other, um, most aspirants went to me. I said, I'm not other aspirants. You can't buy my voice. My my desire to go in there and serve my people and country is greater than to be paid off. So that angered him. While other aspirants with due respect to themselves, I do not say that the, what the governors asserted that they collected money was right. I'm not saying that, but they, most of them, stepped back. 2018? 2018, except for one gentleman named uh, uh, Sheriff Dalhatu. He refused. He was tough on the governor. The, on the governor's candidate then. So, um, yeah, I moved into SDP, and then again, he went all heads on that, how dare she dares me? Do you understand? And um, so right now, we had some peace from 2020, 2021, until now again, the moment I got the ticket, it started all over again. The attacks, uh, the insults, him getting a lot of... Um, his cabinet members and the special assistants and advisors to attack me on social media. It's become like cyberbullying daily from my personal life to even my extending to my husband. It's been a whole unhealthy circle. And then, um, but I would say this, that it's important that not just the governor himself, but politicians at large should be very careful because most of what we do in this internet digital age gets recorded and kept and your term in office whether it's four years or eight years one day will come to an end and the relationships you build or you are able to manage even if it's of the opposition is very important i don't understand how um the governor would would want to face me tomorrow after all of this done when he's no more a governor would he be proud of the utterances he has made would he be proud of the steps um, and, of course, what his appointees have made? Life goes beyond politics. And it's very important that not just himself, but every other politician in Nigeria applies caution during this electionary phase not to heat up violence and endanger ourselves. We're already a volatile country. Nigerians, an average Ghanaian and Rwandan and South African enjoys a better economy than here. We're already pretty much suffering every day. Why add more? So, yeah. Um, you know, you've, repeat, you've repeatedly uh, expressed concern with regard to how the governor treats you 
and you've also alleged some threats to your life. So I'd like to ask you, have you made formal reports to the police and possibly DSS on issues like this beyond making these allegations on Twitter, on social media and the mainstream media? Oh, yes. Um, right from the very first um, statement that the governor made, in video uh, when he went to my hometown, which is pretty much five weeks back, and three others, which clearly states that he will cut off the fingers of anyone who votes the opposition and that in this coming election is going to be a war much more tougher than what happened in 2019 and that whoever dares him, he's going to send them to the grave to serve his mother. So when all these statements were made, we burnt all the uh, videos and made a petition, not just myself, but the party itself, to all the security agencies and international organizations. And also, we recently notified uh, the National Peace Committee, attentioning uh, His Excellency Abdesalam Abuaka and Bishop Kuka of the governor's utterances and pleaded that he be called to order. And um, I, I'm not aware of what, whether they had taken steps, but what I say is till today, we're still facing a lot of threats. Now, um, when we wanted to get the campaign office in Okini, we got a befitting three-story building. The moment we started putting some renovations in place, painting the building, we got a letter from the Okini local government chairman asking giving us seven days to vacate premises. Now, that's a personal property I acquired in 2019, and I donated it to the campaign office, which I've committed no wrong because the uh, Electoral Act stipulates that camp political parties are to be run by donations. So I'm not, I donated that office to PDP. But here he... he instructed the Okene local government chairman to write to me that to vacate that, stating that the location of that office, of that building, as a choice, as a campaign office, um, poised, poised uh, security threats. And I think that's wrong. So we went to court to get an injunction to maintain status quo, but then today was another, they had to bring in some preliminary objections to that. So we're in court on that, and I hope that the governor will just allow things be I should be able to have a right. My party should have a right. Every other candidate in PDP should have a right to express their views, to gather in spaces safe. If the governor feels um, the position of our campaign office is threatened, then he should encourage the police to protect. They should, he should redeploy more policemen to protect that area. Because you know, the fact that, oh, there's a political party there, but not tell us to leave. Do you understand? He should more think of strengthening the security architecture in the state to safeguard lives and properties of all members. You intend to start your campaigns at the end of this month? Yes, please. And uh, you're not afraid, are you? I do appreciate the threats. They are real. I mean, I faced the guns in 2019, so I know. I lost quite a number of my followers. They were killed. Many got gunshots. I remember then each time we went campaigning, at the end of each tour, we would have nothing less than 10 people with bullets. I had a good arrangement with um, the General Hospital Okini and Federal Medical Center, local jail, where we took severe cases, blood banks. We set up blood, we had arrangement with some labs for blood banks. So all of these memories are still in my head. But, and all, and considering the threats now they're real, does that cause any concern? Yes, it does. Does that in any way scare me? No, it doesn't. Does it in any way deter me from going into campaign and meeting my people and ensure that we have emerged victorious at the end of the election of the elections in 2023? No, it doesn't. I'm fired up. Everyone there is tired. If you understand the mindset of a typical Ibera person, the more you threaten, the more courageous we become. We are assertive in nature, and that kind of translates to being a bit rebellious. So what um, has happened now is the people just want a change. Not the kind of change that the APC projected, but yeah. a real, when you talk about fixing the future, you just want to take this huge awareness and participatory awareness where the people want to take charge of their lives and say, okay, this time around, we're going to be cautious of the kind of leaders we are going to send because we are suffering. Now, if you talk about Nigeria's suffering as a whole, Kogi State is worse off because we're one of the poorest states. 
So I have families that survive on just gari a day. And it's terrible. Most of the people I grew up with in the street, because I grew up in Ihima, my formative years were there. And I see most of them having lots of gray hair, looking all wrinkled, looking like they're 20 years older than me. It's all because of suffering. And these people are so committed more than ever to ensure that Natasha goes in there and wins and say, you know what, let's for once make a choice that resonates with our own ideals for our economic social space. And that's, that, is, that is what the people, like, that vigor is what has encouraged people beyond the threat that, you know what, face us with the guns. We are going to exercise our democratic rights. All right. So I'm, I, I like to believe that you expect a better process in 2023 compared to what happened in um, 2020. 2019, I yeah. believe. With the police, one thing again that happened then is we found that the security agencies were not up and doing in 2019 elections. If you look at the reports from the international observers, they actually wrote off uh, the Kogi gubernatorial election as one of the worst off in the history of Nigeria. There's so much violence, killing at the polling units, and nothing happened till today. But what I have come to realize is probably with the new administration of the police and the DSS, that things will be better off. Natasha Kwatu Dwagan, thank you very much for your time on Political Paradigm. Thank you. I wish thank you well. You. Thank you. Well, that's Political Paradigm today. Many thanks for watching. Remember to go to YouTube and search Political Paradigm. Catch up on this and past editions. Also go to channelstv.com. I am Terry Ikumi. Goodbye.